Welcome everybody here today. I'm Josh Schimmel, Executive Director of the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission, a uh, longtime member of the uh, Connecticut River Cleanup Committee, uh, sponsored by PVPC, who's done a great job of pulling us all together here. Um, wanted to give a special welcome to Secretary Beaton for making his way out here. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, as well as a lot of the faces we see here, uh, it's great to see everybody who has kind of been part of this uh, this family for the past 25 years, which is which is great. I um, want to thank, do some housekeeping here, thank Suez and Mickey for uh, sponsoring the event with uh, coffee and pastries. Um, PVPC, obviously, for pulling this together, and, and of course, um, the Pioneer Valley Riverfront Club for hosting us in this great space, uh, which is great to see it being utilized uh, in the manner that it is right here. So. Um, one thing to really note here, because we're here about cleaning up the river, um, this building has a long, long history, and I'm sure Ben will talk about that, but it's sandwiched between an Army Corps uh, federally controlled flood dike, a CSO outfall to the north, and a stormwater outfall to the south. So you got everything that's part of our industry right here in the water resources, uh, and, and no better resource obviously than the Connecticut River, which is really the spine of uh, the whole Pioneer Valley. So we're glad to be here um, and, and representing uh, all the stuff that the clean water agencies do and, and all the folks that are involved. Um, so uh, with that, why don't, Ben, where are you? Why don't you come on up and, and speak a little bit about what you're doing here. They're doing some great things in the past couple of years. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming to my home and office. Uh, Josh, thanks for thanking everyone, so thank you sure for being here. Uh, and I also have some board members who are, uh, took some time out of the day to attend, so uh, thank you, Jonathan and Ruth, for being here. Um, you know, our role in this, um, in this environment is to improve access to the riverfront, to get people down here aware and enjoying and engaged with the river. So between this morning's turnout, thank you all for being here, the 60 kids I'm going to have after school here today rowing and the 20 masters tonight rowing, I'd say PVRC accomplished its mission today. I'm very proud of everyone. But tomorrow, right, tomorrow we start again. Tomorrow we once again renew our effort dissuading people from the misperceptions that the river is dirty or disgusting or inaccessible, and we start the lift all over again, um, which is why, um, you know, which is why, which is what brings me to work every day, my passion to get people educated and informed. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't always that way, obviously, right? Uh, when this boathouse was built in 1901, uh, there were five boathouses on the river in Springfield. And just, uh, that was just 20 years after that, the city celebrated uh, in a time of great difficulty after the First World War, they celebrated the reopening of the Memorial Bridge with a boat race and tens of thousands of people here lining the riverbank, lining grandstands on the bridge, watched a race on the river. They enjoyed the spectacle, they enjoyed the sport, and they enjoyed the betting. I'm told that uh, rowing has a long history of uh, wagers being set. So we like to think of ourselves as part of the renaissance of Springfield. We're bringing rowing back to the city, and someone else has got the gambling part covered. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to keep it brief because I, I want to hear what Secretary Beacon has to say. I'm very grateful for you coming out here. I know you have a connection to, the, to, to water sports as well. hope we'll get some stories out of you on that. Um, and the last two things I want to share with you are uh, my Valley Gives button, right? Uh, May 1st, please keep in mind all the nonprofits in the Pioneer Valley whom you love and know and support. It's an important day of giving to us. And uh, for anyone who would like to come back, have a little celebration here. May 5th is our revelry. It is our annual fundraiser. It's on Cinco de Mayo, so we're celebrating it with um, good food, good fun, a silent auction, and uh, margaritas at our cash bar. So uh, if a youth rower or an adult rower approaches you to sell you a ticket <clears throat> to uh, revelry, we invite you back. And uh, I'm glad you're all here today. And uh, I'll be around if you'd like to take a tour of the boathouse, see the boats, see the history uh, after the meeting is done. So thank you for being here. Thank you. So um, just backing up a little bit, though, you know, th this group has convened for 25 years uh, to clean up with a singular focus of cleaning up the Connecticut River. Um, and uh, we're going to do a lot of thank yous. I'm sure we're going to miss a couple folks along the way. But um, we've had support from the communities, from the politicians, uh, from everybody uh, in this region and to the east in cleaning up this river. And, and there's been a lot of people who have come 
and gone, but still with this singular focus of cleaning up the river. So um, with that, I would like to bring up Mayor Sarno, uh, who's been supportive of the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission for uh, many, many years in our efforts to help clean up the river along with all the other communities. Mayor? Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did anybody hang up their coat? Ben Quick has a unique way to hang up your coat. If you see the coat hanger there, it's made of oars. Am I correct? And I'm glad that I was able to hang my coat up there, Ben. I appreciate that. I want to thank uh, Josh Simmel, uh, our Executive Director of the Water and Sewer Commission, Secretary Beaton, and to Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito. You have been fantastic friends, uh, not only to the city of Springfield, uh, but also to myself here. And we appreciate the continued partnership and working, especially with my uh, Director of Parks and Facilities Management, Pat Sullivan, as we uh, move forward to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Thank you for all the planning you do. To my colleagues in government, City Councilor Katery Walsh is here. I believe City Councilor Jesse Letterman was here, but just uh, left. A lot of acronyms here today. We have the Connecticut River Cleanup. We have the Pioneer Valley Riverfront uh, Club. And if you look upon it, the people that come down here to the north end, north block of the city of Springfield, because at times the depiction the media gives about urban centers in America, they are wowed. They say, this is in the city of Springfield. And I'm glad that my administration has been able to play an important part in, in funding and transforming this. This used to be the old Bassett boat. And uh, uh, the boating business was really uh, going by the wayside in a, in a different way. And this property was not being properly utilized. Uh, we decided to uh, take the onus to make sure that we opened up this property uh, once again to the people of the city of Springfield and beyond to spread the good news about the, the rowing uh, and that goes on here. Some 25 years ago, your committee came uh, together on the overflow situation uh, that was occurring in our rivers. I believe we're still designated one of the uh, uh, heritage rivers uh, in federal government, 10, I believe 10 in the United States uh, of America. We hope some funding comes from the federal level uh, on that. So it's important as we continue economic development, the riverfront, but it's also important to me that I wanted to engage more recreational, environmental activities of the river because that in itself uh, brings vibrancy to the city of Springfield. I could be wrong, you guys are the rowing experts on it, but I understand Harvard and Yale sometime in the late 1800s staged their regatta or their boating races here and that's where the crimson and blue came from. Am I correct on that, Ben? If I'm not correct, say no. I'll still fund you, so don't worry about that. You can't fire you, man. Don't worry. But I understand Harvard and Yale did something uh, here back in the late 18, 1800s. So at times uh, when, again, overflow was coming into our rivers, it was common to be used all across America. Many places still in, in Europe or other areas of the world are still uh, utilizing their rivers for uh, overflow, which is, is not good uh, for environment, not good for the health. But I'm preaching to the choir here, but I do appreciate uh, when you're out there and you tell people, hey, come on down to Springfield. Come on down to the North Block and see what's going on. And I'll end where I started, uh, that wow factor, because when people do come down here, they're amazed. They can't believe that this is in an urban core. And working with Pat Sullivan, uh, parks have been very, very important to me. Uh, that was my Riviera growing up, uh, Forest Park and Emerson White in the South End. My Parents really never were able to go anywhere, and my father was constantly working, but, uh, and my mom didn't drive, doesn't drive. So I revere with the parks, and that's why it's important to me to be able to give back uh, to the uh, people of Springfield. But I thank you for being the, uh, the guardians, being out there at times when it's not popular. And believe me, I know when things aren't popular at times, that you're out there making, advocating, making sure the river uh, is clean so we can recreate, we can economically develop the riverfront, and we can have vibrancy here in the city of Springfield. So to all the acronyms that are here, thank you, thank you, thank you, and especially to Secretary uh, Beaton and Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, which many a times uh, we love having them here, and many a times they come bearing checks, which we appreciate immensely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Mayor. Um, I think we're going to put on a little presentation by um, Bill Fuquay, who is the chairman of the Connecticut River Cleanup Committee, along with Quinn Lonzak from uh, the Chicopee Water Pollution Control Facility. Come on up, guys. Good morning, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to attend our festivities. It's been 25 years since the formation of the Connecticut River Cleanup Committee, and we're going to take this opportunity uh, to recognize the, the work that we've done and the, uh, the work that still needs to be done on reducing combined sewer overflow pollution to the Connecticut River. In the 25 years, we've, we've eliminated more than half of the pollution that, uh, that occurs from CSO discharges, but as uh, we'll explain further in our, our presentation, there's, there's much more to do. The Connecticut River is a major natural resource and a treasure for the, for the valley, whether you're flying on an airplane or, or focusing in from Google Earth. It's a significant geological and physical feature. It's the largest river in all of New England. It spans over 400 miles from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the border of, uh, with Maine or, or with uh, Canada all the way to the Long Island Sound. It was, uh, it brought settlers, uh, communities, and industry to the valley here. So it's one of the, uh, as I said, the longest river in New England. And in the 60s, it was, it was, it was known as the best landscape sewer in America. Since then, and since with, the, with our efforts, uh, it's be, become known as, uh, it's been designated as a federal heritage river by the Clinton administration, and it's one of the first national blue ways in the, in, the, in the nation. We've uh, come a long way since that assessment as a, as a sewer, uh, but there's <laughs> still some distance to go. Our biggest problem in, <clears throat> in the lower Pioneer Valley uh, portion of the river is combined sewer overflow, CSO is another acronym. Uh, what is the CSO? In the early 1900s, sewers were constructed um, so that sanitary sewage and stormwater runoff both entered into uh, the same pipe. Uh, when it rained, these combined sewer systems were designed to purposely overflow excess flows to the river uh, to protect the wastewater infrastructure from being overburdened, uh, the wastewater treatment plant or the pipe itself. Uh, the result was raw sewage discharges directly to the river. CSOs can cause public health problems due to unsafe bacteria levels, uh, bans on swimming, reduced use for uh, recreation, boating, fishing, rowing, flooded basements, unpleasant odors, uh, <laughs> and other impacts. Bacteria levels in the river peak after significant rain events, as you can see here, uh, when they can reach 125 times higher than during dry weather. Uh, with the biggest impacts on the river in the area below the Holyoke Dam. And in this slide, you can see the difference between wet and dry sampling in the 2017 season at this very location, uh, right, out, right outside this building, when the wet weather bacteria counts measured 38 times the cleanest dry weather sampling counts. So how big is the problem? Uh, original number of CSOs across the Pioneer Valley communities was 134 in 1988, including 31 dry weather overflow sites in seven communities. So that's without a rain event. Uh, there were overflows. Uh, our DEP friends know DWO is a very dirty word. Uh, <laughs> or acronym, excuse me. A lot of acronyms. <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, original CSO discharge volume, 1.6 billion gallons every year, enough to fill 160,000 backyard swimming pools or Gillette Stadium one and a half times every year. <clears throat> so the story of cleaning up the Connecticut River started in the 70s with the passage of the Clean Water Act, and the act provided communities with funding to expand their wastewater treatment plants or build <coughs> build new ones for the first time. It wasn't until the 1990s that communities in the, the lower Connecticut River Valley 
were pressured to uh, start addressing their CSO situations. And each community was being faced with tens and hundreds, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars worth of CSO abatement work. And at the time, no one wanted to go, go it alone. And I remember sitting at my office and thinking what we needed to do at the time in Holyoke. And if Springfield wasn't spending any money, we weren't going to spend any money. And we we're just at a stalemate, you know, not being able to, to move forward and address the problem. And it, it, it really needed a regional solution. And it took the, the leadership of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and, and Chris Curtis to step up and kind of group us all together and, and get us working as one uh, toward a, a common goal of, uh, of getting the river cleaner, uh, pursuing and seeking federal assistance to, to mitigate the, the CSO cost impact to communities and working toward achieving a fishable and swimmable water, uh, water body here in the Connecticut River. And as a story, you know, going back, I've been with the committee for, for 25 years, and it'll be a highlight of, of my long career in public service uh, to uh, have worked with this group. And, you know, this was a group of public works officials and wastewater officials that, that would get together regularly. And uh, when money was available, and we did receive, you know, some millions of dollars in, in grant money uh, to put toward projects, we would all get together and we would review projects, assess projects, and we, we would award funding amongst ourselves to the most needy projects. And we all needed more money than what was available, but we all sat, there was no political pressure, there was no egos, there was no hysteria involved with, with the process. We all professionally sat down and allocated the funding that we had available to the most deserving projects. And it was done so well and so professionally, I, I, I'll I cherish that memory and, and appreciate the, uh, the work that everybody, members here today and, and ones before us, put into uh, to allocating those funds. So back to the script. Um, so where are we in 25 years? We've accomplished quite a lot. The, um, through a, a high degree of collaboration, as I, I just mentioned, the uh, you know, over 12 years, we received federal earmarked funds uh, for CSO abatement, totaling $17.6 million in federal and local dollars that were put toward CSO projects, which accomplished the completion or elimination of 46 uh, CSO projects during that time. Some key achievements that we, uh, we, we gained were the elimination of over a billion gallons a year of CSO discharge, 18 million, mi or 18 million miles, 18 miles of the Chicopee River and tributaries have no CSOs. Two thirds, two of the largest CSOs in the Connecticut River have been reduced, and five of our former original members of our, of our group have eliminated all their CSOs and have graduated from our, from our committee. There's a map, um, well, so yeah, we roll back the slide. We, uh, we, we've since reduced <coughs> CSO frequency by over 60% and CSO volume uh, by over 60% in that time with those projects that the communities have funded not only through uh, st federal and state grant funds, but mostly through the commitment of local dollars that have been uh, put toward these projects. And this is a map, uh, I don't know if there's one that was supposed to be here, but there's a, this is a map that basically shows the, the scope of, of all of the CSO locations in the, on the Connecticut River and the Chicopee River, as well as the designation of those uh, CSOs that have been eliminated over the 25 years that, that we've been doing projects. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, I can understand when it's a, a Systems are separated, so the uh, sewage goes to the treatment plants. Okay, so all this water that's from the storm went off. Mm -hmm. where, where are those pipes in turn, uh, emptying into? Stormwater pipes are discharging into the river, or local streams, or water bodies. Does the still, solution have it dis discharge into the lakes. Or the that's streams? currently the the solution, but there's there's uh, legislation, there's rules in place that are requiring communities now to go back and and assess those those discharges and look at the quality. Of stormwater and what what potential impacts they may have on those receiving waters, 
So there's an ongoing program that most communities are involved with. So what's left to do? Um, Bill spoke a lot about uh, the last 25 years, what's been done. We have quite a bit still to do. Our 25th anniversary is a good time to uh, take stock of those, what we have done, and uh, also our needs for the future. Um, Springfield, Chicopee, and Holyoke are, um, remain under federal consent orders or administrative orders to complete cleanup of more than 50 remaining combined sewer overflows. Uh, we can't do it alone, certainly. Our communities have reached the limits of affordability and we need grant funding to support, <clears throat> to support this important work from the federal and state governments. And this next graph, uh, this is an important one. Uh, this is spending to date and our future needs. Um, sel selfishly, Chigabee has spent um, almost $210 million and that's not in the last 25 years, that's in the last 12. Um, we've, we've received a lot of support uh, through DEP from the SRF, through the SRF program. There's a, some gentlemen here from uh, DEP Western Mass too that they've been very important, very helpful. Um, so we'd like to acknowledge that, but uh, still we, p we pay those loans back, so it's, it's a lot of local money. And let's see, three, so totaling, sorry, $376 million spent in the last 25 years. That's three communities. <clears throat> $485 million still to go. Last year's dollars, 2017 dollars. So <laughs> a big job left. So for future funding strategies, uh, the vast majority of CSO funding to date has been strictly municipal with some federal help and the Massachusetts Environmental Bond Bill supporting work in the last few years, four years or so. Uh, the 2014 Bond Bill authorized $10 million for this work, specifically for this work, Connecticut River, of which $3 million was al allocated uh, via capital budgets. Uh, the Baker administration recently released the Environmental Bond Bill, uh, which reauthorizes the $7 million balance of that 2014 figure uh, through 2023, so that was, that's important for us. Uh, we hope in the coming months to work with our partners uh, to go further uh, to secure a $17 million authorization for this work through 2023 uh, in order to expedite this process, which we think could take another century. It, it wasn't created overnight. We think it's going to take a very long time to fix. <clears throat> uh, new state and continued federal assistance is a vital need at this point. Innovative approaches are a must to succeed in the face of budget austerity. Some of our funding strategies, uh, the, obviously the state environmental bond and public works bond bills, uh, continued um, green infrastructure implementation, so things like rain gardens, uh, we, we, we push those things, especially with developers, um, to reduce, uh, reduces the stormwater load into our, our, our combined systems. Uh, advocate, Advocate for uh, renewed federal grant support and innovative munin municipal strategies to leverage other sources. Uh, specifically, Chickabee and Westfield, we have stormwater utility fees. Uh, no, nobody likes to hear that, but it's, it, the dollars have to come from somewhere. So we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars of public funds to clean the river and it's important that the public receives a benefit from that investment. <clears throat> Thanks to the gradual improvement in water quality, there's been a number of programs and facilities that have de been developed along the river. Uh, the Connecticut River Walk, for one, is, uh, spans five communities that allows folks to bike and, and walk along the river. The uh, two facilities have, have been developed, this facility at the uh, Pioneer Valley uh, Rowing uh, Club and the Jones Ferry River Access Center in Holyoke have been developed for the purpose of getting folks down to the river for rowing and water activities. There's been a website created that posts uh, information about the river and access, water quality conditions, and there's been a uh, ongoing volunteer participation and effort to maintain and sample water 
and uh, post water quality results on the, on the website. So as we celebrate our, our 25 years of work and, and look forward to many, many, many more years to go in, in resolving this problem, we want to recognize the, the current members of the, uh, the committee from the Water Sewer Commission, the City of Chicopee, Holyoke, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, our partners <coughs> at the DEP and, and the Connecticut River Conservancy uh, for their support and, and guidance uh, along the way. So like uh, Quinn had said, we've got a, a lot of work to do. We've done a lot of work and we have a lot more ahead of us. So thank you. Thanks, guys, and uh, really important for everybody to remember that uh, it's the municipally owned wastewater treatment plants that have cleaned the river up uh, since the passage of the Clean Water Act. So when you're looking at legislation or you're looking at funding, uh, it's those entities that really do the heavy lifting uh, in terms of, of actually getting the water clean, and it, it's support um, by everybody, and there's a lot of drivers and all of that, uh, and thankfully they're all in this room, so I think everybody in here gets it. Um, with that, staying on script, PVPC. Secretary Beaton um, is our keynote speaker today. Um, he's the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Matthew Beaton is responsible for overseeing the Commonwealth's six environmental, natural resources, and energy regulatory agencies. He's been a great supporter of our work in this role, um, stating during an environmental bond bill oversight hearing last year that the CRCC was one of the most important things facing these communities. It's going to have a great benefit, again, both economically and certainly benefit the local ecosystem of the Pioneer Valley. As a former state rep from Shrewsbury and an avid outdoorsman, Secretary Beaton completely understands the importance of both alleviating pressure to our local budgets as well as preserving our Commonwealth's natural resources. And we're going to get him out here for some smallmouth fishing, is my understanding. Um, so without further ado, Secretary. I'll definitely take you up on the smallmouth fishing. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you all very much for the uh, chance to be here with all of you this morning. It's a very comfortable environment for me. I'm a recovering rower. I rowed for 15 years myself, so to see a backdrop, a backdrop like this is, uh, is wonderful. And to see the rowing machines kind of actually makes me a little, gives me chills. And uh, a, lot of day, a lot of time spent on a rowing machine. But uh, it, is, uh, it is with that, with those experiences of so much time spent on the water, I think is really where uh, a lot of my um, passion for the outdoors came, and not just rowing. Uh, rowing was certainly an integral part of, big piece of my life uh, growing up, but fishing and, and, and paddling and just a tremendous amount of time spent on a variety of water bodies, particularly rivers. And there's something particularly special about rivers, in my mind at least. Um, now I probably spend more of my time not so much rowing anymore, but uh, spending some time when I can fly fishing. And for me, that moment of being in a river and the serenity of a river and the flow of the water, it's hypnotizing, it's mesmerizing, it's powerful. It's a very, it's a very soothing, soothing thing to experience. And to have a fly rod in your hand, and I always say the bonus is catching the fish, you know, the real experience is just being there. And, and that is, uh, you know, that's the power of a river, I think, for, for humans. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of other benefits that come by way, you know, just look at history. Uh, without this river, we wouldn't have had, you know, the Industrial Revolution, what we had, you know, unfortunately, we're paying for a little bit of the price right now, trying to fix some of the mistakes that were made during that time. But there was tremendous value that came from rivers. There's tremendous ecological value that comes from rivers. They provide just so many different benefits to, uh, to, to us. Um, but we've, uh, we've made some mistakes, and now, you know, we know that now. But and unfortunately, it costs a heck of a lot of money to fix those mistakes. But we're chipping away at it. Um, there's no silver bullet, unfortunately. I think there's uh, a lot of planning and a lot of understanding that has gone on that still needs to continue to go on. But I also think we need to, uh, you know, look and celebrate all the great work that we just heard of. I mean, a billion gallons a year taken out of the, the river. That's a phenomenal accomplishment. And I think it's a uh, hats off to all of you that came together. And there's not a lot of examples of municipal collaboration and planning and 
uh, and 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 just the the amount of work that got done on such a, 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 a issue of such magnitude. There are a few examples of things that have had that much of an impact as what you've accomplished. So I, I, I would not take that lightly. It's a pretty amazing accomplishment for um, to just get a, a, a body of independent municipalities together to work collectively towards something and see such great results. It's uh, it's pretty tremendous. And uh, you know, my hat's off to all of you for, uh, for, for taking this as far as you have. But obviously we see the numbers and the numbers are big and the numbers are, it was still a, a, a good ways to go. And you know, the realities of municipal budgets, state budgets, certainly federal budgets, um, things are, there's, there's a lot of need across the Commonwealth, across the country, and in inside of each, each city. So we need to be smart about the way we spend our dollars, and, and uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of needs. And, you know, we'd love to spend all that money immediately, get this all cleaned up and taken care of, but unfortunately, I think everybody realizes this is a, this is a long-term play, and we need to be smart and pick off the low-hanging fruit, a lot of which I think has happened and the most impactful, and really understand it and study. And I think in, in, in collect data, collect information to best know, you know how we should go about this. And I think that is um, seen in a lot of the work, certainly at Mass DEP and DEP's involvement uh, in, in partnership uh, throughout, uh, historically throughout this program, but also continually going forward. Um, the recent partnership with DEP and USGS and uh, to start monitoring uh, the, or continue to build upon the monitoring that exists, adding another um, another station on the New Hampshire uh, Vermont border, one that's similar on the Connecticut border now. And I think as we continue to collect data and understand data and information, that's going to be the powerful tool for us to be able to understand things better and be able to make more educated decisions that are built on data, sound science, and things of that nature. So we're going to continue to partner with organizations with the Connecticut River Conservancy, helping us develop monitoring strategies and continue that work going forward and try to develop you know, a, a bigger data set for us to be able to uh, inform future investments, inform future decisions, and understand what it is that we're working for. I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental bond bill because there's elements of that that certainly reflect directly on, on what I just talked about. There. Additionally, DEP plays a very important role in NIPTES permitting, certainly MS4. We heard about that. Uh, MS4 is that stormwater issue that you were talking about, sir. Um, and a, a huge impact, uh, recent, uh, um, uh, I guess, mandate of sorts coming down from the federal government on compliance with those programs and a huge impact on municipalities and something that we are certainly, certainly Commissioner Suberg and Team DEP is working very closely with the municipalities on to try to alleviate as much of the burden as possible. Uh, that said, there's also compliance under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, NIPTES. Springfield, I know, is in the middle of the repermitting process uh, for the uh, wastewater, uh, the regional wastewater facility. And, uh, and DEP is certainly a partner with that. I think it's actually in the public comment period now. Uh, so there's a lot of moving pieces of, uh, with either re-permitting or a lot of other uh, stormwater related issues that directly impact the water quality here in the Connecticut River. So we most certainly will continue that partnership and look forward to helping any way we can to you know, work with the municipalities to you know, get through those processes and, and, and try to get the, the right solutions that both balance the impacts on the municipalities and the environmental quality. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about the environmental bond bill that you heard. There is certainly the reauthorization of the money, uh, continuation of some of the money that was allocated a couple of years ago. Um, but there's also a number of other elements that directly and indirectly impact the work that you're all here today to, to celebrate. Um, we have included new authorization for compliance for the MS4 permitting. It was $11 million that will basically go through the Department of Environmental Protection to work with the municipalities on compliance with the new obligations uh, under the MS4 permit. Um, uh, so that, that is a new item that we have, uh, have, have never had authorization for before. So that'll be uh, great for us in our continued partnership uh, with the municipalities. Um, in addition, the big picture, there's an authorization of about $270 million for environmental-related um, 
uh, expenditures, uh, much of which comes through would flow through the Department of Environmental Protection, and that and that deals with air and 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 soil and and of course water. Water is a big piece of that pie, and there's a lot of different elements and a lot of different programs uh, run through the Department of Environmental Protection that affect water quality. And another new allocation on t in, in that 270 million dollars is increased uh, an increased account 10 million dollars for more data collection. Because what we've realized is, um, well, it's not news. We've, really, we've known this for a long time, but <coughs> we wanted to reinforce the, um, the need for this is, with data comes good decision making, comes more impactful use and better return on the dollars that you invest. So we really wanted to double down on the data we're collecting and really understand the dynamics of what it is we're up against and testing water, water quality and water flows and really trying to get as much data into the decision making process as possible to inform us and help guide us in the expenditure of the finite amount of dollars that we have. So the, the whole point behind this is to really use the dollars we're spending as smart as possible and, and, and really try to leverage them as much as possible. And, and then finally on the environmental bond bill, there's another element, and I'd like to thank the mayor, uh, that there's a, a really key, important sort of foundational element of the, bond, the environmental bond bill. Um, so much of it builds on Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito's leadership relative to climate change. And living in a river valley, you experience the effects of climate change many times a year with large water flows and what those water flows, because you know, that's the peak time where you're having those CSOs flowing into the river. And one of the elements of a changing climate is more intense storms, more frequency of storms. What that translates to is more flows coming out of the CSOs. So when we really you know, reel things back and look at things holistically under the umbrella of climate change. It's a, it's a huge umbrella. There's a lot that falls into it. So we, you know, on the, the coastal part of Massachusetts, um, this part of the Commonwealth, Hurricane Irene, is probably the best example of the severity of, 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 of potential storms. We really are starting to see a greater frequency of, uh, of, of this change in climate, and it's time for us to really uh, double down on it. So Governor Baker signed an executive order, the environmental bond bill two years ago. The environmental bond bill codifies that executive order and it puts a renewed focus on the mitigation strategies of the Commonwealth to stop our contribution to uh, a changing climate. But what we're really having a renewed focus on is the uh, adaptation and resiliency of the Commonwealth. And you can think of it as uh, CSOs play certainly a, a foundational ro role. Culverts, stormwater strategies, dams, seawalls on the coast, natural solutions. We, you heard those green, uh, the green strategies. That is certainly a, that, that, that's what we really need to be focusing on is the natural solutions to serve as a buffer for these impactful storms that come in these extreme weather events that come with, with climate change. Part of that is a very long-winded way of me getting to what I'm talking about here. Part of it is this municipal strategy that we are, we are uh, rolling out right now. And we are doubling down over the next few months and have an RFP soon to be on the streets to, that we're announcing later this week to um, uh, get as many communities as possible into our municipal vulnerability preparedness plan. And what that is, is it's part of a larger statewide strategy for us to really get a snapshot from one end of the Commonwealth to the other of identifying the most vulnerable assets and the key pieces of infrastructure that need investment to buffer ourselves to make the Commonwealth more resilient and more adapted to a changing climate. So we're working with municipalities to identify what those vulnerable assets are, and which will ultimately all work up into a state plan that is informed by the findings on the municipal level to help us make smart decisions going forward and smart investments again with a finite amount of money. We're just trying to be as smart as possible, not be one-off, not be reactionary, actually start planning for what is going to be a huge number and a huge investment and a huge dollar value of what we need to do to really prepare ourselves for the impacts of climate change. And the MVP program, basically what it is, is we would provide economic, you know, financial resources to the municipality to hire a trained consultant. We have over 200 trained consultants across the Commonwealth that can come into the com community and help build, uh, uh, help to work to identify what the resources are and um, 
provide the data, that, the normalized data that we're looking for to be able to input into our statewide strategy. With that comes a, a lot of um, technical tools, a, a, a new website, a new web platform that is the first of its kind with climate uh, projection data for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the first of its kind where we're going to be able to input the data that we collect on the municipal level, put it on top of those data layers, and actually visually see where we think the most vulnerable assets, how they will be impacted with the climate change projections on top of it. So it's going to be a really exciting, very powerful tool and one that we don't currently have. So my ask, certainly to um, the uh, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to work with your communities, one of which the mayor is already a participating community in the MVP program, and we thank you very much. We have 73 communities so far in our first year of rollout on this, and we're trying to get all 351 to participate so we can really have an educated plan, develop the plan, and then a couple of years down the road start working the plan. And, and we're even going to, we have money allocated in this bond bill to start doing a lot of the projects and a lot of making the investments that we determine. So more money, hopefully we can be back with a check because you were an early buyer in on the MVP program. We think we're going to have some early implementation money to actually start addressing some of these issues. And I'll put a big bow on top of this. Like I said, CSO issues are certainly a climate related issue and there's certain, certainly negative environmental impacts. So I'm hopeful that the outcome of the member participants in the Pioneer Valley will help us to uh, make those informed decisions in our MVP strategy, which will you know, largely and you know, potentially could involve uh, more money to go towards the issue that is, I think, the end goal of improving the overall ecosystem and environmental quality of the Connecticut River. So we ask that each of you uh, go back to your community, help us out, help us help you, and uh, we look forward to continuing the great partnership and uh, here's to another 25 years of great success. Thank you all so much for having me here today, but even more importantly for the work that you've done over time to commit yourself to restoring what is a, uh, a, a treasure for the Commonwealth and for the nation, really, in the, in the Connecticut River. So thank you all very much for the opportunity to be here. We really appreciate it. Congratulations, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Secretary, thank you. And, and folks, for, for those of you um, that aren't involved in policy and operations and legislation, uh, the man knows what he's talking about. He, he gets it. So um, it's really important for us to hear that uh, coming out of Boston, uh, that the politicians and the leaders understand the challenges that we have. And uh, that talk right there is candy for people like us who are in the business. So fantastic. Good to hear. And I'm not a Boston guy. I'm a Central Yeah, yeah yes, I, I understand that. Oh, 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 um, that um, so, uh, fantastic uh, discussion there, and, and uh, you hit home a lot of points that, uh, as administrators uh, of the water sector, uh, really ring true with, with the folks in this room. So, um, we're going to get to some thank yous here, so I'm going to apologize in advance for everybody who I forget, um, but kind of dovetailing into what you're talking about, DEP um, have been great partners in this, um, and, and the uh, Baker uh, administration has been fantastic in, in helping develop that um, uh, that relationship with DEP. So Brian Harrington and Mike Gorski uh, and and Mike McGrath over here, we've partnered with and we've done a lot of great things, including the, the sampling program with USGS and DEP. So um, they play a really key role. Kurt Beaujolais, retired member uh, of DEP, who was instrumental uh, in this group uh, for so many years. So we want to thank them. Andy Fisk and, uh, and Andrea Donlan from Connecticut River Conservancy. Um, you know, they, they've had a seat at the table for probably the past 10 or 12 years as part of the committee uh, and have really helped kind of educate us from their side of the view. Um, so we have a really good balance of kind of operational um, viewpoint and user viewpoint. So just a really good balance to have. Um, obviously, PVPC and, and all the members of the committee, including uh, those that have graduated, as Bill had stated, uh, the, the communities of Aguam, Ludlow, South Hadley, and West Springfield had smaller issues than Springfield, Holyoke, and Chicopee, and, and so they've eliminated their CSOs, and, and uh, kudos to them for that. 
Um, our federal partners, the US EPA that we've been working with really well, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern and Richard Neal, as well as, uh, of course, Congressman Ulver, um, who, who really helped uh, get a lot of funding to come this way. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Ed Markey, um, as well, who have representatives here. Um, let's see, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission we, we spoke to. Um, and then the volunteers that have worked with uh, Connecticut River Conservancy, as well as some of the other agencies where, you know, whatever the events are, whether it's a, a regatta on the river, whether it's the cleanup every year, whether it's Earth Day, a lot of work goes into all of these events, and it's all volunteers. So uh, a, a lot of all of our staffs in the, in the public works, in the water sector, we volunteer our time uh, on the weekends, afternoons, nights after work to kind of make all of these events happen because we're fortunate. You've got a lot of passionate people in the Valley who, who spend a lot of time actually on the water. I, too, am a sportsman. Um, so uh, it, it's really fortunate that we have such a great group of folks who have been engaged in this, uh, in this small group and have gotten uh, so much done. Uh, again, I want to thank Suez for um, uh, providing the refreshments. Uh, and the Riverfront Club for hosting, but we, we have one more thing here, and, and there's a tight script here, which I'm gonna go off of, which is gonna drive some people crazy. So we have an award here for Chris Curtis tonight, today, um, and it's a service in support of the river, and, and I'll read the script in a minute, Chris, but um, Secretary Beaton talked about how hard it is to get different communities to work together, and, and nobody knows that more than Chris, because he herded the cats for 25 years of, the DPW directors and water and sewer directors um, for uh, multiple agencies, and we got together and we haggled over money, and um, you know, a bunch of municipalities haggling over a few pennies is quite a scene. And, and Chris somehow uh, organized us. Everybody got a fair shake uh, and, and really brought together uh, this group. And, and I mean, we've done really great things in 25 years. So, um, I, you know, and, and we're going to talk a little bit, but I think Chris has really um, had a vision and it's really um, rung true. And you see some of the younger staff here uh, who have kind of taken this on and, and are the future of what's coming down the road in all sectors uh, of water resources. So now I'll go back on script, Chris, okay? So, um, there's one person that we felt deserved to be singled out for special recognition, and that's Chris Curtis. Chris has been a tireless supporter of the Connecticut River, and in particular, our CSO Cleanup River. Chris started working for Pioneer Valley Planning Commission in 1978, more than 40 years ago. Chris, you would never know it, um, and accomplished a lot during his time there. Uh, he was thought by many to be the man behind the curtain, making countless environmental initiatives possible here in the Pioneer Valley, and ushering in over $40 million of funding to the region, which is... is just unbelievable um, accomplishment. So Chris created and staffed the committee honored here today um, and secured 10 years of federal line items to reduce CSOs and then worked with partners at DEP to secure uh, state funding when federal support dried up. So um, unbelievable what he has done and, and to kind of have been part of it, as Bill had said um, over the years, it's just been really, really good group to be part of. Whether the goal was to clean up the Connecticut River or protect scenic, scenic byways or plant hundreds, if not thousands of trees across the valley's urban reaches, Chris worked day in and day out to bring together a diverse network of public and private partners in stewardship of the region's natural beauty. His support, sorry Chris, uh, and the innovative ideas of colleagues and collaborators was a mark of his true leadership. Um, Chris's vision, um, that if he could bring people out of their homes and schools and office buildings into the natural world via the rivers and streams and trails and bike paths that he helped build, maintain and promote, that he would be nurturing the next generation of stewards of the Connecticut River and the Pioneer Valley. And he has done that, certainly. Um, so without further ado, Chris, you want to come up um, and say a few words? And it's been a, a real pleasure. Uh, a real pleasure uh, to having come in when uh, I had no gray hair, and, and you, you didn't have it either, uh, and work with all the folks who were really uh, kind of the pillars of public works um, in the Valley for so many years, and, and uh, your leadership and their leadership has really helped form what we're doing, so thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all, Josh, and, and to the Connecticut River Committee and, and everybody that uh, has worked on this uh, project for so many years, really appreciate this award. Um, I think 25 years ago, we couldn't have imagined that uh, this committee would have um, 
been so successful um, that it would have lasted as long as it did and, and really brought as much money um, funding into the region as, as it has. Um, so the Connecticut River, I think, as a lot of people have said, is, is really a treasure for our region. And, and to me personally, it's always meant a lot to me to, to live on, uh, work with, um, and paddle the river um, over the last 40 plus years. Um, what I think has been special about working with the Connecticut River Cleanup Committee, and the word collaboration has been mentioned over and over again um, today, is, is that it's really been all about collaborations. This group has worked so well together um, it's really a group of, of, uh, of friends and colleagues that have, um, have really um, worked um, well and, and it's been such a rewarding and, and fun, really, activity to, to be part of. Uh, as has been said, we, we established this group in, in 1993 and we used kind of a, at that point, an innovative approach to, to getting it started. We, we signed an intergovernmental compact between the communities, a, a memorandum of agreement. Um, that originally had seven communities and the Planning Commission involved in it. And that um, tool really enabled us to sort of bring these communities together in a way that um, wouldn't have been possible otherwise. We didn't have a, a Boston MWRA type of, of a group, so um, we needed something that would enable our communities to collaborate. And it gave us um, a really uh, a, a big important thing, which was political clout. Um, so we collaborated, and we collaborated, as, as Bill and Josh and others have said, um, with um, Hartford, Connecticut. We collaborated with our congressional delegation, Congressman Olver in particular, but many others. We collaborated with US EPA. Um, we established this congressional budget line item that uh, for 12 years in a row was, was funded and, and brought in um, millions of dollars into the region, and then more recently, collaborated with um, Secretary Beaton and Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and DEP um, to bring in additional state funding to the region. So um, a lot of collaborations. I, I think perhaps the craziest example of a collaboration I can think of in our, our history. How many of you remember the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Anybody? <laughs> OK. Well, at one point, we collaborated with the creators of the Ninja Turtles to uh, prepare a comic book that was um, used to educate urban children about what happens when combined sewer overflows go into the Connecticut River and what we can do about it. Um, so uh, of course, the Ninja Turtles hang out in sewers, so that was a perfect opportunity to sell that idea to, to, to communities. And they're local. And they're local, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so my, I guess my, um, my request, my fervent hope um, for this group is that um, as you begin your next 25 years that you will continue to collaborate, that you'll continue to work together, um, you'll, that you'll continue to work towards finishing this job um, and this shared vision for a clean Connecticut River. It's been truly um, my pleasure um, to work with all of you. Um, you've been an incredible group to work with. and. And thank you so much for this honor. You know, Chris, they didn't write in the script that I was supposed to hand you this, <laughs> this acknowledgement. So, uh, oh. Turn to the right, Jamie. <laughs> So uh, just in closing, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I, I do think that we also um, owe a debt of recognition to uh, all of those folks that support uh, the utility work. We have one of our board members, Dan Rodriguez, here, and who has been instrumental in helping to support this. And then uh, politicians and counselors who support each of our utilities uh, and departments. It doesn't get done without the money. And we cherish every dollar we get, and we stretch it as far as we possibly can. Uh, and, and I don't think there's a better group of people who can stretch a dollar farther and get more bang for their buck than public, public works, and in particular, uh, water sector uh, folks. So um, keep that in mind when you're making your votes on your budgets and when you're looking at uh, rate increases. Um, Chickabee, we uh, selfishly, again, we actually closed 
we abandoned a CSO last Thursday. So there you so, go. Yeah. Yeah. Part, of that, part of that was, uh, part of that was a state grant, or part of the bottom belt. So last Thursday, we closed another one up. We're down to 20. From, we're more than halfway. So with that, um, thanks, Chris, for all your service. Thanks, all of you folks, for coming. And uh, be sure to walk around, look at the posters, uh, and get a chance to walk down to the riverfront and, and check it out. It's pretty nice.